to talk about book three of the Republic. We've been talking about uh, the education of the guardians. And Socrates and Adamantus have gone through stories about the gods and the heroes and talked about how, how those things work and what's good and bad and so on. But now Socrates says he wants to shift the conversation to talking not about the content of poetry, but about its style. Uh, and that discussion that moves now from, uh, in book three, from 392C to 412A, I think is, is uh, one of the richest and most exciting parts of the book. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so to get into that, I want to go back first and remember how the conversation about education began and to remember the point they made there. This is back in book two. Uh, they first start talking about uh, education in music and gymnastic uh, at 376E. And then right after that, at 377A, you'll recall Socrates says, Don't you know that the beginning is the most important part of every work, and that this is especially so with anything young and tender? For at that stage, it's most plastic, and each thing assimilates itself to the model whose stamp anyone wishes to give to it. So they're going to talk about the education of the guardians and what it takes to have a good education. Uh, and the point that Socrates is making, quite a profound point, I think, is that it's important to understand that education, most primarily, is not about the inputting of information. It's about the formation of who you are. And that's what that remark says. It says, you start off, you could be anything, but you're going to take a particular stamp and you're going to become a particular kind of person. So we're going to be considering the things we're going to consider, the matters of style and poetry and so on. We're going to be considering those things from the point of view, not of how they present some object that the soul can think about, but about how they form the soul, right? Not about the content of our experience so much as the formation of our experience. Uh, so that's the context of education. But again, we're going to be educating the guardians. So let's go back and remember that, what, what our issue is, right? And again, this is from just right before that. This is when Socrates was talking about Glaucon at uh, 375C. Uh, the point there was we have seen that the very nature of the city, the very nature of a human community is that there is a role which is caring for that community as a whole. Uh, in, in, the, in its initial interpretation, that's, that's a, a matter of military protection. It's a matter of taking care of the community in the sense of fighting on its behalf. That's how the guardians first uh, show up. And we're going to go on later to look more exactly at just what the role of guardian is. But in any case, it's in the context of talking about that role and what it demands that this educational issue is raised. Because the, the point is you need people who are going to fulfill that role and so the question is like, well, what do you have to be like in order to be good at that role? And this is where a problem emerges because it seems like to be good at, you know, using force to fight effectively against people means you got to become a kind of fierce and violent person. But the problem is developing that character trait, uh, which, which will be appropriate for, you know, how you're going to relate to your enemies. It, on the surface, uh, on the face of it, isn't compatible with developing the kind of character that will do the other side of protecting, which is being nice to the people you're supposed to protect, right? So that's what they said at 375C, right? Where will we find a disposition at the same time gentle for taking care of its own and great-spirited for being courageous and, 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 as they say at another point, savage in fighting against uh, enemies? Uh, and Socrates says, because, you know, sh surely a, a gentle nature is opposed to a spirited one, right? Uh, and Adam, uh, Glaucon agrees, and Socrates says, uh, yet if a man lacks either of them, he can't be a good guardian. Uh, so these conditions, the two conditions that have to be met for there to be a good uh, guardian, resemble impossibilities. And it would therefore follow that a good guardian is impossible. So that's the situation we're working with. We have a problem, which is that we have a role we need filled. But if we try to define what kind of person could fill that role well, it seems to be inherently contradictory. Uh, but then they, they have raised the question in the, in the pages between 375 and 377, they've raised the question whether the right kind of education can deal with that. And so that's what we're now looking at. What does it take to educate a person to be a good guardian? So it's in that context now that we're going to look at these matters of style.
Socrates begins by making a distinction between two kinds of poetry, uh, basically descriptive poetry and reenactive poetry. Uh, in the you know they, it's translated in in Bloom as narrative and uh, imitative. Uh, I I want to uh, I want to hesitate a minute with that translation as imitative. It's not wrong, but I think it can be misleading. Mimesis I think is better understood in in this context and generally if in in terms of reenactment. And the thing they're really going to talk about is whether when the poet is telling the story, the poet describes what happens, or uh, writes as if someone were saying it, right? Which is to say, writes dialogue, puts puts the character in action in the story, reenacts the action in the story, uh, and so that's the the distinction he wants to make. And as I talked about in the last video, you know, that's most obviously, as as Adamantus notes, that's most obviously the style of uh, tragedy and comedy. Um, so Socrates uh, wants to focus on that distinction and um, think about the impact or the relevance of mimesis, of reenactment, or imitation, in education. And the discussion is quite interesting, but it's got a lot of confusions in it. So it begins, uh, this is at 394D, when Adamantus says, so I think you're considering whether we're going to admit tragedy and comedy into the city. And that seems pretty straightforward. So, you know, we've been talking about whether we should have certain kinds of poetry, whether they're proper for education and what impact they'll have. And so now we're talking about whether imitation is a good thing. And so it makes sense to say, oh, you're talking about whether tragic and comic poetry should be there. Seems straightforward. Uh, Socrates says, perhaps, and perhaps something still more than this. So it's an interesting response. Now, one part of that, as I mentioned before, is that it seems like Plato's philosophy would be another example of that. So I think that's part of uh, what we should take out of Socrates' remark there. But that remark should also just alert us that we have to think about what's going on here, since Socrates says, well, maybe I'm not just talking about tragedy and comedy. So it's important to ask as you go through here, what are we talking about? And I think if you go through and ask that question, you'll find it's actually a little confusing. Uh, so Socrates then says, okay, now Adamantus, reflect on whether our guardians ought to be imitators or not. Well, the whole context is poetry. And to be an imitator in the context of poetry has meant to compose poetic works that, you know, take the form of reenactments, that take the form of, you know, dialogue, right? Uh, so it's a funny question to ask whether our guardians ought to be imitators or not, right? On the face of it, that should mean, should our guardians compose imitative poetry? Should they be tragic poets? Uh, and by the end, again, when uh, they get to 398A, that's where they say, well, I guess we're going to say, if somebody comes to town and says, I, you know, I wrote these great tragedies and comedies, or somebody like Plato comes and says, I wrote these great dialogues, uh, we're going to say, yeah, that's great, but you can't be in our city, right? So by 398A, uh, it looks like, yeah, that that is what they were talking about, whether there should be composers of tragic and comic poetry and so on. It's a little odd, it seems to me, already to ask whether the guardians should do that. Since when we were defining the role of guardian, we weren't defining it as the role of poet. And indeed, that should raise a question going back all the way to the discussion of sort of the division of labor in book two, when we were defining the essential roles of the city, you know, we had farmers and uh, people who make houses and people who make clothes, we had tradespeople, and then we got to guardians. Uh, we didn't really have a discussion of poets. Uh, the, you know, embroidery was mentioned, th things did come up. And then of course, we talked about what kinds of stories we should allow. But there never really was a discussion that said, uh, isn't there an essential role for poetry, for, for artists in the sense of fine art in the city? That never really came up. Uh, so surely we should ask, well, we should ask two things. Was their account good enough? Did they miss something? Uh, but also, you know, where are these things supposed to come from? Where do they come from? Uh, any, in any case, he says, should the guardians be imitators? Well, first of all, uh, if they're only supposed to be doing one thing, like if, if you're only good at one kind of art, uh, 
Like you, you can either be a farmer or a guardian. Well, then surely that would be true of being a guardian and a poet as well. So at that level, the answer should be no. And indeed, that's the very next thing that he says. He says, does it follow from what went before that each one should do a fine job in one activity, but not many? Da, 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 da. So he says, does it follow from that point we made before that people are really only going to be good at one thing? Uh, does it fall from that what our answer should be? And I, I would think on the face of it, the answer should be, yes, it does follow. On the basis of what we said, we should not imagine the guardians to be poets. But that's not at all how the conversation goes. And so the, the question of what, what we're meaning when we're saying that someone is being an imitator or a reenactor uh, sh should be on your mind. Like, what, what are we talking about? And as you go through uh, the next, uh, I don't know, a couple of pages, the next three or four pages, what it means to talk about the guardians being imitators seems to shift in a few different ways. So, uh, you know, the, the discussion right after that, when they, they you know, he says, so, sorry, he says, uh, should that earlier principle answer this question? Uh, the way he takes that up is that, well, isn't it the case that just as a man can only do, you know, one thing really well, isn't it also true that you can only imitate one thing really well? Uh, so, that principle is taken up, but it's not taken up in relationship to the question whether the guardians should be imitators, but it's taken up in terms of what kind of imitating one should do. And we have to now be thinking about what we, we should be asking ourselves, what's going on here when we're talking about imitating or reenacting in that context? Well, so then that really becomes, or it takes another step uh, around 394, sorry, 395b to c, where Socrates says, first of all, he defines the guardians, and, and then he says uh, what the relationship is to reenactment or imitation. He says, if then we are to preserve the first argument, that our guardians must give up all other crafts and very precisely be craftsmen of the city's freedom and practice nothing other than what tends to it, then... They also mustn't do or imitate anything else. So the question was, should the guardians be imitators or reenactors? And now that has turned into the question, in uh, what should they imitate or reenact? And he says here, they should only imitate or reenact this stuff. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But here again, it, it really doesn't seem like they're talking about writing poetry. right? It seems like they're talking about reenacting in the sense of... Uh, living out something, you know, imitating imitating a style in your behavior rather than producing poetic works. So he says if they do imitate, they must imitate what's appropriate to them from childhood. And that goes back to that early remark about the formative character of education. And he says, so they should mem imitate men who are courageous, moderate, holy, free, and everything of the sort. So it seems like we are talking now about something that you're doing from childhood and it sounds to me like what he's really saying is in their behavior they should be reenacting or imitating modeling themselves on taking the stamp of the forms of these uh, different kinds of behavior so in other words the notion of to imitate has shifted in this conversation it seems to me from the composing of poetry in the form of dialogue to the idea of the child behaving in a way that reproduces established models. Um, so uh, let me remind you also of the thing he said here, because they gave you a kind of a definition of the guardian, right? The guardian is to be very precisely the craftsman of the city's freedom. So we're going to have to hold on to that uh, uh, for a conversation we're going to get to a bit later. Uh, but notice that that sentence already sounds a little bit different than the definition of being a good soldier. Uh, but in any case, what, what, what it seems like you're supposed to do now, not in the sense of create poetic works, but in the sense of practice as a, as a imitative behavior or reenactive behavior, is the, the way courageous, moderate, holy, free men act. Uh, and again, I'll just note as an aside there, the inclusion of holy and the inclusion of free. Courageous and moderate, that's kind of stuff we've heard about. Um, 
being crafts from the city's freedom. That word just came up. Well, so free comes up again here. So that one seems like a bit of a, you know, new development, but uh, reasonably straightforward. But holy is interesting. I mean, of course, it also makes sense that uh, we have been talking about the gods all along. But I just emphasize again that that uh, that theme of holiness as a character type or whatever uh, hasn't really been thematized at all. Uh, and you know, I've been bringing up the theme of religion all all along. Uh, we might be asking, okay, what what should that entail? They haven't discussed that. Uh, anyway, okay, let, let's let's read a little bit more. He says they shouldn't practice what is uh, sh slavish or shameful. Um, so that they won't get a taste for the being from its imitation, right? So it sounds here like what they're saying, again, emphasizing this idea that they're talking about behavioral practice rather than poetic creation, right? Is that uh, when you uh, get in the habit of acting in a certain way, you start to believe in that thing. You start to believe that that's the right way to act. So you get a taste for the being from its imitation. And he says, or haven't you observed that imitations, if they are practiced continually from youth onwards, become established as habits and nature in body and sounds and in thought? Uh, so, you know, again, this is a, a by itself, that's a pretty interesting and a very significant development of that initial remark about the plasticity of the child and and how we become formed as persons. Very rich and powerful theme. Uh, but notice that it has taken us away from our discussion of mimetic poetry into what you might call mimetic practice. Uh, again, that comes up at 396a. He says, uh, so, you know, you should be imitating the right things, not the wrong things. And he says, nor do I suppose they should be accustomed to likening themselves to madmen in speeches or in deeds. For although they must know both mad and worthless men and women, they must neither do nor imitate anything of theirs. So again, I just want to underline that idea of uh, ongoing practice that imitates something rather than poetic creation. Uh, and the distinction then between, in, in this case, knowing of something versus uh, reenacting it in your behavior. A significant uh, point uh, to hold on to, I think, for later. Uh, but so then, a little bit later, Socrates says, here re referring to a remark Adamantus made, so it's not it's not quite the same falling out of his own line of thought, but he says, uh, okay, if I understand what you mean, there is a certain form uh, of style and narrative in which the real gentleman narrates whenever he must say something. And again, another form, unlike that one, in which the man of opposite character speaks. Uh, the point there is just that we've now added kind of a third sense of what mimesis or reenactment might mean. We had poetic creation. We had the enactment of certain types in your behavior. But now we have something that's a little bit more like poetry, but not quite the same. Uh, what you do when you're speaking. And he says here, you know, that uh, the, the, the thing to discuss here is the idea that a, a person of good character will be quite selective, a man of good character, will be quite selective uh, in which ways in which other people speak and act he will be willing to reproduce in his speech. Well, I said speech and speak and act, but I guess it's really just speech. So that, uh, that seems like a significant thing. And I guess my point, as I said before, is not that there's something wrong here so much as it is, this conversation is alerting us to the multiplicity of different levels at which this issue of mimesis is operative. That it, it is an issue in genres of poetry, but it's also an issue in forms of behavior that are practiced from childhood on that are kind of like the models of a character type. Uh, so that, you know, if you think of Judith Butler talking about gender performance, for example, there's a very similar point being made here, right? That we children practice the way of behaving that is this type or this type, which is the courageous man, the just man, and so on. Uh, and so in that sense, 
our characters, our kind of performance. Uh, analogously to the way Judith Butler says gender is a kind of performance, uh, that that we are reenacting models. Uh, and then a third role is, or a third point is that in the very ways we speak, we are reflecting a similar set of decisions, and I suppose therefore value judgments and all the rest, about uh, what is eligible to be spoken and what is ineligible, what forms are proper to present and what forms are not. And the point that, they, that comes up here with Adamantus is that uh, at the very least real class distinctions are marked out there. People of a certain class will speak in a certain way and people of another class, the Calcagathus, the gentleman, would never speak in that way. Right? So it's showing you that in these poetic styles, uh, or I shouldn't say poetic styles, in these uh, styles of speaking that are kind of like the types of poetic style, you also see class distinctions being presented. And in as much as Adamatus wants that kind of person to be the one we're producing, well, then that's saying that's the way we should speak, right? Um, uh, but so they go through that discussion. But then again, as I say at the end, it does come back to uh, genres of poetry and what should be included and what should not. So there's a there's a lot to unpack there in a conversation in which a variety of very important and powerful points are presented, but presented in a sort of a confused way. It's really up to you to, to think through the, the whole set of uh, connections and relations that are really implied there, but have not actually been laid out for you. So the conversation moves on from that discussion of sort of genre to discussion of music now, which is to say, you know, melody, harmony, and rhythm. And uh, the conversation shifts from a one from talking with Adamantus to talking with Glaucon. Uh, and again, I, I think there's something really quite profound here. Like it was, uh, it's a significant point to begin with, to say that education is about formation rather than information. Uh, and it's a significant point to notice that uh, the poetry of our culture plays a huge role in that. Right? Those are some of the main points that are being made at the end of book two of the Republic. So even if Adamantus's approach to those questions leads the conversation to go in often not very insightful directions, the book has opened up this really powerful domain to think about, and Socrates has laid in a lot of provocative things to help you think about it. But it then they then moved within that discussion of poetry to say, What's powerful about poetry? You, you know, you might think that what's powerful about poetry is storylines, but uh, Socrates then moved on to say, well, but we also have to think about genre, particularly at this level of whether you describe or whether you reenact. Well, one of the things he said in there was that, you know, the, the, the thing about uh, reenactive or mimetic poetry is that, uh, as he says at 393c, the poet hides himself. It was kind of like Plato in his writing. Like, you never get to know what Plato thinks in the sense that he never tells you. And similarly with the tragic poet or the comic poet, all you get is the presentation of these characters. Uh, so the the genre does a funny thing, right? It reenacts something for you. And in so doing, in a way, the the fact that it's a work of art is kind of hidden. Because the poet... That which is, you know, making it or channeling it, if it's inspiration of the gods, that is hidden, right? So the, the nature of the work is hidden within the work. You know, Heraclitus says uh, nature loves to hide. In, in this kind of context, you might say this poetry likes to hide, right? That the, um, the very nature of reenactive poetry is that the fact that it is a poem is not thematized it's not made a theme whereas in narration it, it, it you kind of say i'm narrating right and that hiding of the poet goes hand in hand with something he talks about in now in the context of practice but maybe we should be thinking about this in the context of poetry as well remember he said 
Haven't you observed that imitations, if they're practiced continually, become established as habits and natures? And remember, he said right before that, we don't want the guardians to get a taste for the being of an undesirable thing from its imitation. So, you know, that passage was about what happens when you practice, when you do it. Uh, but if we transfer that back to the theme of poetry rather than a child imitating certain things, we might think about the same point, right? In imitative poetry, the poet hides himself, or the fact that imitative poetry is poetry hides itself. And familiarity with that imitation uh, can lead you to get a taste for its being. It can sort of convince you of the thing that that is being reenacted. So, you know, I said before that in that opening discussion about imitation and in The Guardians, we had three different uh, candidates for, for what we might be talking about when we talk about being an imitator. We talked about uh, the poet creating poetry as a kind of imitator. We talked about the, the child reproduce the, the guardian as a child reproducing patterns of behavior as a kind of imitator. And we talked about the gentleman speaking in a certain way as a kind of imitator. Those were three different places where we saw these relations of imitation being played out. But I want to suggest now a fourth one, based on those remarks about the poet hiding himself and uh, developing the taste for the being of something through its imitation, uh, coupled with this idea that we're going to remove the tragic and the comic poets from the city, right? I think the sense you might get there is uh, about what happens when you observe these things. right? When you are the witness to the enactment on stage of the poetic reenactment of certain kinds of behavior, that has an effect on you as an audience member. And so we, we can ask, what effect does it have on us to witness imitative poetry? And surely that is the core question behind this whole discussion, right? Because we've been talking about, as they say here, what kind of poets we're going to allow in the city, right? We've been worrying about the imitative, or sorry, the educative value of, of poetry. And we're asking about the educative value of the imitative poetic arts. Uh, so it seems like we should be talking about uh, the audience member. And so the very things then we said about what happens to uh, a child when it imitates a certain kind of behavior uh, should be the things I think that we're thinking about here. I mean, they may not uh, transfer exactly, but there, are, but there should be similar questions, right? What effect does it have on us as um, attenders to, witnesses of imitative poetry? Uh, what what effect does it have on 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 us as observers? On, effect on our character or whatever else, and uh, and I wonder now if we might think of a similar kind of uh, persuasive effect uh, that comes from witnessing certain things, such that you become convinced of their being uh, while failing to notice the artistry. Uh, among other things, that could be a pretty powerful route for talking about, you know, just a familiar sense of kind of propaganda. Right? People with uh, evil intentions advertise things in a certain way or, you know, make movies in a certain way uh, for the sake of essentially talking you into something you didn't know you were being talked into. Right. But the but the poet you know, hides himself, the filmmaker or the advertiser isn't what you're confronted with. You're confronted in the ad with whatever, you know, the fit teenage boy trying to go on a date with the beautiful teenage girl. And it turns out if he buys this product, he's going to get the date or whatever. You know, there, something something is being sold, a product, but it's being sold by a kind of manipulative message, right? And the, the way that certain scenario is reenacted kind of talks is intended to kind of talk you into its being while concealing the fact that hey hey i am a script writer and an advertiser trying to manipulate you so if we bring out that last role of the observer of an imitation or the witness to it to a reenactment uh, uh, and think through the very kinds of issues that uh, we've just been talking about 
with the habit of practicing behavior from childhood in the context of the uh, guardian who's growing up, I think we can see even a further dimension in which this um, analysis can be quite powerful. Anyway, that is about the uh, power of sort of genre, specifically with respect to the self-concealing artistry of reenactive poetry. But now they move on to something that I think, again, is even more powerful. So it seems to me that Socrates, or Plato, whoever you want to give credit with the uh, sequence of the conversation, uh, is taking us more and more deeply into the formative dimensions of poetry. First, drawing our attention to the fact that there even is such a thing, but taking us deeper and deeper into the way we're affected by these things. And so they move on now to music. And as Socrates says at uh, 401D, so Glaucon, I said, isn't this why the rearing in music is most sovereign? Because rhythm and harmony most of all insinuate themselves in the inmost part of the soul and most vigorously lay hold of it in bringing grace with them. And they make a man graceful if he is correctly reared, if not the opposite. Um, uh, you might not have thought of it, right? But the thing that's affecting you and in a significant way shaping who you are is not just the storyline being played out and not and also not even just the sort of poetic genre of presentation but the very way uh, melody and harmony and rhythm are being used right so that's the that's the next theme that they talk about so from 398c to 403c glaucon and socrates talk about music they talk about the educative effects, or I might say the persuasive effects of harmony and rhythm. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details of the text, partially because they're talking about uh, Greek music, and it's not 100% clear uh, in the modern day what that meant. But the points they're making uh, are easy enough to make sense of in relationship to contemporary music. So I want to just try to give you a, a sort of basic sense of what the thing is that they're talking about. So first talking about harmony, uh, they distinguish a bunch of modes and they're wondering, you know, what's the right kind of mode for education? They distinguish the wailing modes from the modes suitable for drunkenness to the one suitable for war making men. I don't want to uh, try to get into the specific modes they're talking about, but I'm going to uh, play you something uh, that just makes a basic distinction between major and minor which I imagine is something that you know many people are already familiar with. But even if you have no idea what it is, you should be able to hear a basic difference in the two types of things I'm playing. So what you're going to hear is two songs, but it's not just that they're different songs. They have a basically different feel to them. So just listen to this. And I'll contrast that with this. first one uh, seems to me sounds kind of bright and sunny. And the second one seems to me to sound kind of dark and somber. Uh, and that's the basic difference between the uh, things written in major and things written in minor. Uh, you can even have that just in a single chord, not in a whole song. Here's an A major chord, which I think you'll see is bright. And then I'll change to an A minor, which I think you'll hear is dark and somber. Here's A major. Here's A minor. Uh, uh, I hope that's uh, clear enough. Um, the point is just that you can, by, by selecting uh, which notes you play and which notes you put together with which other ones, uh, you make these different harmonic modes, basically, uh, that have a certain kind of feeling to them. And so, as, as he says here, you know, are there certain ones that are suitable for wailing? Well, yeah, there are some that are, you know, sort of sad. Uh, are there ones suitable for drunkenness or for warlike men, war-making attitude? Yeah, maybe, like in, in the sense that you can think about the kind of frame of mind you want to be in to do those things, and you can say, well, is there music that's suitable to that? 
Um, it's not just harmony. So let me let me do something else. I'm gonna I'm gonna play um, a couple of little short pieces. Also some some tunes of mine, just so you can hear a few differences. So listen to this first one. <laughs> Now contrast that with this one. And then uh, and then the last one. So I'm imagining you can hear that those songs feel different. Um, partially, it's the modality that's being used, the harmonic choices. Uh, partially, it's the tempo, faster or slower. But uh, uh, partially, it's also the rhythm, whether it's one, two, three, one, two, three, or whether it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you know, within that, you know, where the accents lie and so on. Um, so my point is just that you, you put these things together and what you hear is something that actually feels like something. And that's what different songs do, right? They, they, any song you hear, ignoring words, just at the musical level, any song you hear kind of conjures up a world or a universe that you inhabit. But it's not a world where you would say, oh, there's, there are these characters doing these things exactly. It's more a kind of world of feeling. Right? And so, so the point is, by the use of harmony and rhythm, you set up in a person a feeling. Right? So remember that re remark that, um, that I read before. Uh, isn't this why the rearing in music is most sovereign? Because rhythm and harmony most of all insinuate themselves into the inmost part of the soul. Yeah, they're, they're interesting things, music, or rhythm and harmony, right? Because you can only really hear music by feeling something, right? The, listening to music is not just a an ear phenomenon. It's not just about uh, the sensory reception of sounds. It's about uh, getting a certain attitude on. Um, so, uh, so I hope that's clear enough just from listening to those examples. And, and then certainly if you think about your other familiar experiences of music, I, I, I hope you can think, oh yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and then to, to bring out the power of that, then I'd like you to think about where you see that deployed all the time, in case you had any doubts, right? Listen to movie soundtracks or TV soundtracks, right? Uh, the movie maker tells a story and gets you wrapped up in it, but you don't just see people walking across the stage saying things to each other, right? You, you very, very regularly are hearing music. And one of the things that's amazing is that you often don't notice it, right? You get caught up in the scene and you're wrapped up in thinking about, is this character going to do this? Like, maybe it's like, is that person going to kill that person? Or are they going to have sex? Or uh, don't watch out, there's a scary thing going to happen. Or better run or, you know, whatever. But you kind of meaningfully invest yourself in the world that's being conjured up for you in the movie, in the story. And you invest yourself in it with, by bringing the appropriate feelings to the scene. And, you know, where are those feelings coming from? Well, partially they're coming from the story, of course. But they're very highly uh, encouraged and doctored and maybe manipulated by the music. I think it's pretty easy to imagine a scene of a, I don't know, a dark alley or a dark street or a forest or whatever. You put one piece of music behind it and you're going to think, oh, that's romantic or, oh, that's so uh, peaceful and whatever. Or, oh, that's scary, right? You can have that scene, put the right music on it, and it will sort of tell you what to feel. But it's not like you have an intellectual response that says, oh, they're playing that music. I guess I'm supposed to think this about it. It's that by hearing the music you see that thing out of a certain attitude out of a certain feeling uh, 
so you know remember that, that thing I uh, he said before about the poets hiding themselves uh, well in a very similar way the, the music kind of hides itself or that's I guess that's another version of saying the poet or the musician hides himself in that there's a thing being done to you that produces an effect but you tend to not to notice that an effect is being produced rather you just feel that thing as you're as you're wrapped up in the story anyway i hope that those uh th that those uh, examples are familiar enough sort of contemporary things that you can say oh, yeah right I, I see that point and so they're really just talking about that they're talking about the way uh analyzing music isn't just about you know learning mathematically like this frequency does this with this frequency and blah 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 it's really learning about how these different ways you can do things like just the rhythm with which you beat the drum or the set of notes you pick to play the way those things conjure up worlds of feeling and uh, so when you are listening to music similarly to when you're watching tragic drama on the stage uh, you are uh, participating in certain kinds of reenactment, right? A story is being reenacted on the stage, but then you're kind of practicing that imitation, right? You're reenacting what it is like to be in that situation. And that's true with the music too. Listening to music is, is kind of like um, putting on already scripted ways of feeling that you that you practice inhabiting you know so i was comparing uh the, you know the virtues in a way to uh judith butler talking about gender performance well you could think of something similar here too right that in music uh you're in in the music that you listen to and adopt you're taking on uh kind uh, the kinds of emotional worlds that that have become popular and you're learning to inhabit them but for that reason it, it's something worthy of being thought about critically too uh just like those other things and and indeed because it's so uh beneath the surface maybe you have to even be more careful about that because it's a thing that's having effects on you that you probably never even really thought about so we can ask what is the effect of growing up with certain kinds of music as opposed to others you know children children in school you know often have to learn uh the national anthem you know and there's a certain kind of music that goes along with those national anthems. Uh, I think it's probably the kind of thing they're imagining as warlike. I mean, it is military music, typically. Um, it's the kind of music people use in military marches. Uh, so, you know, whether or not you think it's military, uh, uh, larger groups of people who have a lot of power have decided this is military. And looks like they're right, because they get people to do it, and it has the right sorts of effects. My point is you can look around the world and by seeing what people actually do with music, you can see that there are uh, ways of making martial music. There are ways of making erotic music. There are ways of making, I don't know, whatever else, dance music, party music, drunkenness music. Uh, so I, you know, I think you can reasonably ask, I'm not gonna try to answer, but I think you can reasonably ask, you know, what, what effect does it have what effect did it have when, you know, around the 1960s, popular music really changed into this massive um, development of rock and roll music, rock music? Uh, like, you can ask that question in the sense of you can say, was it good? Was it bad? Like, there are, there are things to figure out about how that uh, relationship to music uh might well have changed in some significant way the formation of persons seems like a worthwhile question <laughs>
and uh, it sets up certain kinds of anticipations. It, you know, it, it sets you into a world, but the the development of the music is kind of the exploration and unfolding of that world, and and to a significant degree, it is. Uh, it's kind of like a, a question is posed, and that question comes to be answered. Uh, so, the in other words, music music isn't so much just a bunch of sounds, as it is the establishing of a sort of sense that um, is worked through. And you, in in learning to listen to music and learning to to hear music well you learn to um, hear things in those terms. You're, you, you learn to appreciate, you know, how something develops, uh, where it gets completed, and so on. Uh, so I want you to listen to one more little uh, piece of music. Uh, and this, this, what I want you to notice here is you're going to hear a, a person playing the, the bass, but I think what you'll hear is through a series of notes, you're you're more or less hearing a, a story, right? That the not, you couldn't say what the words are exactly, but if you listen, uh, there is something started, and it's sort of coherently developed, and and you sort of hear uh, sort of where it's going, when it comes to rest, where it takes a turn, and that sort of thing. So listen to this. So I think that what you learned from, or what, the, what they're talking about, what you learned from uh, spending time listening and getting familiar with music is how to hear uh, a well-articulated thing being delivered in music. The kinds of music you, you get uh, familiar with really ends up uh, um, shaping what what you're going to be able to appreciate in music right so you know from an aesthetic sense you might think well big you know that's fine so if you want to like certain kinds of music you have to do this blah 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 whatever um, the point here isn't an aesthetic one though the point here is there is a kind of sense being communicated in music and the familiarity you develop with it is uh, an ever deeper sense of how to hear certain things fitting together with certain other things how to hear when something is completed and really sort of cultivating your ability to care about that and so music in that sense is kind of an education into good form uh, and that could be true of other things too you know probably painting and all the rest of those things architecture and so on the thing about music though as he said is through through rhythm and harmony like it insinuates itself into your soul in that sort of gripping emotional way and so uh, educating yourself in music is conditioning yourself, is, tr is, is educating yourself into a, a kind of an emotional attunement to good form, being able to recognize something that's well put together uh, uh, when you encounter it. Uh, they then go on to ask us a, a, a similar question about gymnastic, you know, phys, phys ed, like what are you really learning there? Right? So, you know, my point about music was it's not just an aesthetic issue in the sense that you hear something, you have a nice time. It's educating you into emotional landscapes and within that, educating you into how uh, richly meaningful things can get put together. Right. Uh, well, so gymnastic, you know, what, what are you doing when you're when you're running laps or throwing a volleyball or whatever? Well, you know, of course, you're trying to keep your organism in good shape of course that's a part of it like you know what you want your heart to develop and your muscles and your bones and all the rest you know that's for sure but 
just as music is kind of educating you into good form, uh, gymnastic is, is similarly educating you into some other things as well as those direct sort of uh, organic, as, as well as giving you those direct kind of organic improvements. Um, you know, when you, when you have to exercise, you have to deal with bodily discomfort. And so you have to learn uh, how to endure things. Uh, and as you do that, you also get stronger. And so in, in, through initially enduring difficult things, you develop greater capacities for interacting powerfully with the bodily environment. Uh, and the kinds of obstacles you can encounter you know, get more and more strong. So things that might once have been intimidating become easy for you to deal with and so on, right? So the, the development of your body uh, can, or I suppose should, go hand in hand with the development of your attitude, development of your confidence, uh, development of your um, uh, sense of what you can do, but also your feeling that you should do certain things, uh, develop certain kind of discipline and so on. Uh, and you can imagine other things too then if you engage in team sports, if that's your sort of approach to gymnastic education, uh, you know, uh, there you have to develop, uh, or I shouldn't say you have to, you can develop, uh, you know, attitude of, of wanting to be part of a team. You can learn about cooperation. Uh, you can learn about uh, the kind of attitude you need to bring to, you know, uh, make the make the game good for yourself and for other people. Um, so, so the, the point there, in other words, is that you would be wrong to think that physical training is a matter of just developing your body. I mean, you could make an analogous point about eating. Sure, eating is about nutrition, but uh, when you go out to dine, it has a lot to do with socializing with other people. And so if you want to understand what's happening in people's dining practices, you've got to look at to a lot more than nutrition. Well, similarly here, if you want to understand what's going on in gymnastic practices, you'll see that there's an awful lot more than just getting big muscles. An attitude is being developed. But then, just as we can ask about music, you know, what effect does it have that rock music became so popular in the 60s? Um, and maybe a good effect, or maybe a bad one, but we can ask that question. It's a, it's a meaningful and worthwhile question to ask. We can ask the same thing about uh, phys ed, about gymnastic training. Like, what effect is it having on these people that they are having to spend all their time or not spending any time playing football or playing soccer, you know? And, you know, if you have a coach who's taking you into soccer and, you know, pushing you to win all the time, that's a different kind of attitude than a coach who's taking you into soccer to try to get you to play a game with other people and so on. So you can see how uh, your sporting culture and your gymnastic culture more broadly uh is relevant to the formation of who you are and so we can and once again we can think of that at the level of the child growing up like what happens to your child in school when uh, when they're you know going to phys ed class and all the things they do in the public school system what what's going on there uh, but also what's going on culturally with the way we have um, you know at the same time we brought in rock and roll uh, we've you know massively developed the broadcasting of uh, hockey and football and those things, right? So there's this huge sporting culture that has developed as a popular medium of entertainment, and you know there are related ways that people are really wrapped up in playing it. What what is the effect of those things, uh, um, good or bad, and so on? Right? We can we can think about that as uh, the effect they have on the on our formation as persons. <laughs> conclude now by talking about sort of what the point of this discussion of education is here in music and gymnastic and you know I think that what what you're seeing through the way Socrates talks about education in music and the way he talks about education in gymnastic is that that the being educated in those things which is to say spending time 
getting wrapped up in those worlds and, and sort of learning about them and learning from them. Uh, being educated in those things is really a matter of infusing a kind of meaning into your experience of, you know, sounds, pleasing sounds or whatever, and, you know, the movements of your body, right? The, the gymnastic education results in you experiencing your bodily activity as a way of engaging with, you know, matters of value, you know, issues of what you're going to stand up to, what you're, what you're going to uh, struggle for, how you're going to interact cooperatively with other people and so on. Uh, uh, educating yourself in music, getting familiar with music, is learning how to um, hear sense in sound and rhythm and so on, um, and actually looking for it and uh, desiring, uh, you know, good form rather than sloppy or simplistic form and, and indeed being able to see with ever greater sophistication you know what good form is like so these are both music and gymnastic are both about how the things of great value come to be experienced by us in these most sort of finite and bodily matters or another way of putting that is these matters of great value are always at play in the world of our bodies and good education in gymnastic and music is about us learning to appreciate how much the world of our bodies is infused by these deep questions of beauty and goodness and moral responsibility and so on that moral responsibility I'm, I'm taking from you know that sort of notion of standing up courageously in the context of cooperative activities and so on uh, um, and so that that's that's what they've been saying and so where, where is this going well we're talking about the education of the guardians and we need the guardians well initially it seemed like we needed them to be good soldiers but now we see they actually need to be uh, craftsmen of the city's freedom craftsmen hmm, meaning what exactly does it mean they have to make the city's freedom well maybe in a certain way yes i mean that's cer certainly something that you know the, the productive crafts do but even if we ignore the productive side it means that's what they're expert in they're expert in doing the things that are necessary for the sake of the city being free well once that definition was given and and you know surely that is the sort of thing we have had in mind throughout a lot of the discussion once we have that thing in once we have that definition in front of us, we can then say, well, is it right to think that they're just soldiers? And as we'll see in the immediately following section, no, we actually have to mean by the guardians something significantly more significant than soldiers. We have to actually mean what we would normally call government. And they're going to immediately talk about, you know, overseers, rulers, something like that. So we'll, we'll get to that next time. Uh, but basically, we're talking about those uh, educating those people who have the responsibility in the in the richest meaning you could give to this term of protecting or preserving the city, the society, the community, the civilization, and so those are people who need to be uh, uh, to to care for it. Uh, they need to, and so that pertains to this early remark of being gentle towards their own. Well, they, they need to love this thing and think it's a thing they have to take care of but that taking care of has to go hand in hand with being prepared to defend it and also has to go along with being you know wise and insightful in knowing what is best for it and so you can see in the discussion here that uh um there are there are characteristics a guardian has to have you know we already anticipated them when we talked about the the um the guardian having to be great spirited and gentle their, their characteristics a guardian is going to have to have but we're we're actually starting to get a richer sense of what those are uh, so he's saying here now that you can see that that music and gymnastic as the earliest uh 
avenues into education, which is to say into the formation of persons, really have sort of on their horizon the development of those essential characteristics in a person. Like it's, it's through those domains that we lay the foundations for how we're going to deal with matters really of uh, courage, cooperation, uh, insightful leadership, uh, uh, attunement to things of value, beautiful and good things, and so on. Uh, and so they they come to that conclusion, uh, uh, especially around 410, uh, let's say roughly C to E, where they talk about uh, the development of the good character of the guardian. Uh, and I'll just read a few passages here. So, you know, he says at 410 uh, B and C, he says, Then Glaucon, I said, did those who establish an education in music and gymnastic do so for other reasons than the ones supposed by some? Where that reason is typically supposed is that the latter gymnastic should care for the body and the form or for the soul. And Glaucon said, what else? And Socrates says, well, it's likely that they establish both chiefly for the soul. And that's the point I've been getting at, right? That the, the, the point Socrates is trying to make is that in a fundamental way, these things are formative of how we develop really basic uh, values and, and become the core of our character. Way back a long time ago, Kefla said the character of a person is what's important. Well, this is where it's happening. Uh, and so then Socrates talks about what happens. He says, well, you know, it, and, you know, I anticipated this in remarks earlier. If, you, if the uh, um, person gets too wrapped up in gymnastic, then they become savage and hard. If they get too wrapped up in music, they, they become soft and tame and so on. Uh, and he says, surely that's because the savage stems from the spirited part of their nature, which, if rightly trained, would be courageous. Uh, but if it's raised to a higher pitch than it ought to have, it'll be cruel. And he says, wouldn't the philosophic nature have the tame, but if it's relaxed somewhat more, it'll be softer than it ought to be. But if it's finally reared, it will be tame and orderly. Uh, and don't the guardians have to have both these natures? Yes. So the soul of a man who has them thus harmonized would be moderate and courageous, right? So the the the, the thing that's that's coming out here is that the what we're looking at is where the seeds of a, a moderate character, where moderate means um, not being uh, overly swayed by um, simple pleasure and pain in their unrefined state, right? That those aren't the things that make the decisions in your soul. Uh, um, but, but rather uh, you... Uh, are oriented through your experiences of pleasures and pains towards you know what is good and that's that's what you're uh, taking guidance from it came up actually uh, earlier at 389 DNE and they said what don't our youngsters need moderation and they said uh, he, and he said aren't these the most important elements of moderation for the multitude um, being obedient to the rulers and being themselves rulers of the pleasures of drink sex and eating Maybe we can talk about that later when we do talk more directly about moderation. But I think the thing I'm getting at here is sort of that second one. Uh, our relationship to pleasure when we're moderate is not uh, that we think, oh, the greatest thing is just being wasted and whatever you would say about sex and eating, right? That, that the, those things in their simplest and most direct form are all we can think about as the good. But on the contrary, that musical education is about finding in those domains of pleasure uh, deeper deeper senses of meaning and looking for something deeper than just what immediately sort of strikes us. Uh, the issue of being obedient to rulers, I think, again, is uh, being able to recognize and be guided by good sense, uh, uh, be, being orderly in your ability to uh, follow intelligent direction. And so I, I think that's that's sort of roughly the connection there. So education in music is laying the foundation for that. Education in gymnastic, he says, is laying the foundation for, for courage, for being able to stand up to something in challenging circumstances. Well, let's take that back to that initial uh, presentation of the Guardians in Book 2, right? They, there they were saying, well, what's going to be the good soldier? Isn't he somebody who's going to just be savage and cruel to the enemies and so on? 
um, which is somewhat reminiscent of the way Paul Marcus initially uh, talked about justice as being good to your friends and cruel to your enemies back in book one. Um, I think the, the sense you're getting here is a little bit different, that, yeah, we need, we'll need our soldiers or whoever, we need our guardians to, to be prepared to stand up for the thing they need to stand up for, the values they hold to be most important, um, uh, even if it means they're going to die, right? Because they're not going to run away from frightening circumstances and so on. Right? The thing that's, that, that's going to make you a good soldier isn't that you're savage, it's that you're courageous. Right? And the, the cultivation of courage fits quite well with the cultivation of gentleness or moderation. Indeed, it's having these things, the, these different sides of education balanced that allows this sort of flourishing of this, this healthy and good character. So that's, that remark about uh, warriors as being kind of savage, well, that actually sounds more like what happens if you get too much gymnastic. Right? It was savagery, uh, which seems like maybe it does go hand in hand with the abil with the inability to be gentle towards your own. It doesn't seem like the right way you'd want to develop a good soldier. It seems like precisely how you would develop a soldier to make them a bad guardian, to make it someone who is oriented towards cruelty and uh, you know whatever else competitiveness but not oriented towards the pursuit of the good uh, whereas courage is quite different right courage is uh, i think standing up for what needs to be stood up for right and the development of these things then is is helping a person from a very young age be attuned to the deeper issues of what's important within the sort of immediate terms of bodily and experiential life, uh, in contrast to someone who is simply swept up in uh, the the most sort of brute uh, reactions to, you know, how can, like how can I punch back at something that frightens me or something that hurts me, or uh, how can I take, you know, how can I get more of that great pleasure that comes from this uh, uh, taste of this food or what or whatever. Right there, of course, we have those very simple reactions. Children have them when they're born and so on. But the, the, the goal is to develop depth and sort of meaning in our relationship to those things rather than staying at the level of those most simplistic responses or indeed cultivating. Right here you see that savageness is cultivated. Cultivating a character such that we respond to antagonism, let's say, with savagery rather than rather than courage but so with socrates you know you you i mean socrates said way back in book one in response to glaucon like he doesn't want you to go around uh committing injustice against other people so i think partially we're getting the answer here to what it means in the context of being a guardian or the context of being a soldier what it means to be doing that justly as opposed to doing that unjustly mm -hmm.